high class and uh, just just the few that will be here and we'll, we'll just combine them well, about Wednesday uh, Rusty asked me if I would take the high schoolers and the middle schoolers over into the uh, the chapel and teach that class as well and that that was just fine uh, but then uh, Friday came around and uh, Tim called me and said I'm I'm not doing good I need you to teach uh, the auditorium class so we, we're taking four classes and we're bringing them right in here so uh, that's where we're at this morning uh, we do need to be praying for Tim he's just I uh, can't get over uh, whatever whatever he has so we need to be praying for um, Tim are there any other prayer requests that we need to be praying about how is how's Varan All right. Varan is doing better. Her leg is still swollen. Uh, still needs to have her, her leg propped up. But she is, uh, she is doing better. But let's keep praying for her. So. Um, Stewart family. Keep praying for the Stewart family. Yes. Okay. Okay. James Smith, and this is your, this is yours. So this is your son-in-law. Okay. And he had a heart procedure, six and a half hours, and Monday, and they still there's still a leakage that they can't, that they can't find. Okay. We'll be praying for James. Anyone else? All right, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you on this cold but beautiful morning, Lord, and we're just so thankful that we have this ability to come to you, that we have this ability to come to you in, in prayer, that we have this ability to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and study your word. We thank you, Lord, for these opportunities. We pray, Lord, that we never take them for granted. We pray, Lord, for those... Um, on our prayer list, Lord, specifically for Varan, we're so thankful that she's doing so much better, Lord, but we continue to pray for her and her leg. Uh, please be with her as she continues to recover, Lord. We pray for Tim, who's, uh, again, unable to be with us this morning. Please be with him, and we pray, Lord, that the, uh, that the tests that he has already uh, taken, Lord, will, will eventually come back with results to help him know what needs to happen, Lord. Just be with him. Uh, we pray, Lord, for the Stewart family, and we're, we're thankful for them in our congregation. Lord, be with them during this, uh, during this time of loss. We pray, Lord, for James Smith and his heart, Lord, and the, uh, the leakage. We pray, Lord, that they find uh, the, the, the source of the problem and that the doctors are able to help him get back to a good health. For anyone else that we might have not thought of at this time, Lord, we pray that, that you be with them. We pray, Lord, for the study that we are about to um, dive into here in the book of Hebrews, Lord. We, we're thankful for all of the teachers in this congregation. We're thankful, Lord, for all of the students in this congregation. We're just so thankful for all that you do for us on a daily basis. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for how he has indeed saved us. And we're thankful, Lord, that we have the ability to go to heaven Thanks to everything that you've done for us. We pray, Lord, that we always put you first and we always put others above self. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, go over to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Again, this is just a, a fill-in class. I know Rusty in the uh, chapel class is in Acts, I believe, chapter 21 next week. And then Tim's getting ready to start Romans chapter 1 here in the auditorium next week if, uh, uh, if he is able. So what we're going to do this morning is uh, quickly or, or pretty soon we will be running over to Hebrews chapter 2, specifically in verses 9 through 18, but I want to start off in chapter 1. We're going to start off in, in Hebrews chapter 1 and I want to make a couple of observations. 
about what the Hebrew writer is doing here in Hebrews chapter 1. One of the things he's doing in the first chapter of Hebrews is he's making a comparison. A comparison between Christ and angels. Christ and angels. Six times in chapter 1 he makes this comparison. Five times in chapter 2 he makes this comparison or at least talks about angels as he's talking about Jesus Christ in all of these 11 different occurrences in these first two chapters. So I, I want us just to look at a few of these specifically. Um, let, let's start off verses 1 through 4. Let's read this together and then we'll talk mainly about verse 4 and then we'll briefly look at a few other things because I think it will uh, lend some good light into what we want to study here in the second chapter. But look at starting in verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Look at verse 4. Having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. All right. This is our first occurrence here of, uh, of this, this comparison of, of angels and, and Jesus Christ. Of course, these entire four verses right here talk about Jesus and how, of course, the Lord has, has used his son for our benefit to take care uh, of you and I. Uh, you'll remember there in verse 2, he's, uh, God has spoken to us through his son, through the word. He even made the world with his son. And then, of course, he saved us, verse 3, made purification of our sins through his son. But then here in verse 4, he became much better than the angels. Being made. Um, th this is not being made, rather. Um, there are some groups, some religious groups in the world, unfortunately, who believe that uh, Jesus is an angel. That Jesus was um, Michael, uh, what was the uh, archangel? Um, Jehovah's Witnesses believe this. Truly a sad thing. We'll, we'll talk about that here in just a second, just as a, as a side note, if you will. But here in verse 4, whenever it says, having, beca having become as much better than the angels. Um, what are we talking about right here? How could Jesus Christ, in a process, be made better than the angels. If he created the world, if he created the angels, if he's already better than the angels, how could he go through a process that would make him better than the angels? Any, any passages come to mind that might help us out with this? What about, what about Philippians chapter 2? What about Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and following, which talks about how we need to have this attitude, which was also in Christ Jesus, and how he emptied himself? Okay, uh, not regarding equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Okay, what does that mean? What did, what did Christ do? Christ was up in heaven. Christ was up in heaven. Christ is God. He's one with God. He was, as we see here in uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, he made the world. As we see in John chapter 1 verses 1 through 3, he of course was in the beginning with, uh, with God and he, he was God. Okay, so, so here is God, but in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and following, we have this understanding that he emptied himself. Not emptied himself of being God, but what did he empty himself of? Maybe some, okay, well, maybe some of the uh, attributes of God, maybe the ability, not, not, not emptying himself of God, but maybe emptying himself of the ability to sit there at the right hand of God, being in heaven, some of the blessings uh, of being God, being up in heaven, he came down in the form of you and I. In the form of a baby, he came down, and then, of course, he, uh, uh, he, he's living a, a human life, right? Lower than the angels, something that we're going to see here. Uh, look at verse uh, 7. Look at chapter 2 and verse 7. Chapter 2 and verse 7. You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. Look at verse, uh, chapter 2 and verse 9. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower 
than the angels, okay? He was above the angels because he, he would have created the angels. He would have created the world. But now he has allowed himself, he emptied himself to become lower than the angels, becoming a, a human being like you and I. This is a very humble, humble thing he has done. This doesn't mean that he's a created being like the angels. This doesn't mean that he is uh, the archangel, but rather he has come down here and he has become like you and I. But now he was having become, it says right here, much better than the angels. Back in uh, uh, chapter 1 and verse 4. Yes. 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 That's right. Great point. And if you didn't hear what, what Paul said, they would have been very well aware, acquainted with the understanding of what happened with Moses in receiving the law, of course, from the angel of the Lord. And now you have this understanding that now we're under a new covenant and it's brought in through Christ himself. Brought in through Christ himself. So you have this comparison right here. So great point right there. Um, Yes. Yes. There you go. Great point. And with both of these points right here, think about what the Hebrew writer is doing. He's taking two groups or, or individuals that the, uh, that the Hebrews, that the Jews were, were very acquainted with and v held in high esteem. The angels holding the, uh, a great high esteem with these angels. And then Moses, right? I mean, you have Moses, you have Abraham, you have these, you have these individuals, these, these rocks of their law, of the Jewish faith. And here's the Hebrew writer coming to them saying, our Christ is greater than both of these. So, so great point, uh, uh, both of you gentlemen right there. Um, I want to I wanna read, I know I quoted just a little bit of it, I want to read Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 5 and following real quick. I'll read this. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the, in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also... God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. You have God. God gave up his benefits of living up there in heaven, came, coming down here on the earth as a man. He, of course, uh, was obedient to the point of death, and now he has this name which is above, of course, um, uh, every other name, which, of course, brings us back to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 4. And he has inherited a more excellent name. A more excellent uh, uh, name. Sad, and, and this is just kind of a, a side note. This, this uh, discussion this morning has nothing really to do with the Jehovah's Witnesses, but uh, this is just a, a, a good um, place to, uh, to talk about this. If you're talking to a friend who is a, a Jehovah's Witness, and, and they're talking about how Jesus Christ is really no greater than an angel, he is an angel, um, it, it's sad to note even what their Bible translates, because their, their Bible translates um, there in verse 6. Look at verse 6. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Okay, here's Psalm 97 and verse 7 that they are quoting, that, that the Hebrew writer is quoting. This is our train, this is, this is the New American Standard right here. Let me read to you the New World Translation. Let all the angels of God do, and I always mispronounce this, so someone, uh, an English person may have to uh, uh, help me out with this one. O obeisance. Is it, am, I in, am I anywhere close, close with that? Honor. Let's just give honor, okay? 
They, they've taken this verse and they've decided that Jesus is just someone to receive honor like someone would receive a prize uh, for doing a good deed. No, that's not what this is about. The angels are even going to worship him. So, he's greater than the angels. You see this here in verse 4. You see this in verse 6. Look at verse 7. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. There's a couple of, uh, of occurrences of the word angel there. Um, look over at verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Uh, look over at chapter 2 and verse 2. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Uh, look down at verse 5. For he did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking, but he has testified somewhere saying, What is man that you remi remember him or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. Um, of course, verse 9 we've already read, but we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels. We'll read more about verse 9 here in a second. Look over at verse 16. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the, de to the descendants of Abraham. Something else we'll talk about here mom momentarily, but this is what I'm wanting you to see. Jesus, angels, Jesus, angels, Jesus, angels. There's a comparison going on. And the comparison, if you go all the way back to verse 4 of chapter 1, is this. Christ is greater than the angels. Christ is greater than the angels because he is God. He is God, just like John chapter 1, verses 1 through uh, 3 talks about. He is God. Now, go ahead. Yes. Great point. You've got the, 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 the avenue that the law was given to the people. This is better because it's the messenger and it's from Christ. But even the message is, itself is far greater because the law can't sa it could not save you. But this can save you. Great point. Anyone else? All right, with that in mind, I want you to be thinking about that. Christ is greater than the angels. And this is something that the Hebrew writer is trying, to, trying for the, uh, the Jewish people to understand. And now, the, the Jewish Christians, now we go over to chapter 2, verses 9 through 16, which is going to be our, our uh, main, or uh, 9 through uh, 18. Chapter 2, verses 9 through 18, which is going to be our, our main discussion with the 30 minutes or so we have left. And that is this. Here is Jesus Christ, who is greater than the angels. And what does he call us? How does he view us? And I believe as we look through this, these passages specifically, we're going to start at verse 11. He calls us brethren. In a way, he's, he's our brother, okay? And this is a very humble thing for him to, to say and to call us. But look there at verse 11, chapter 2, verse 11. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. If you want to feel, if you want to, if you want to realize what God thinks about you, what Jesus Christ, how Jesus Christ views you, not only did he come down here and, and die for you, but why did he come down here and die for you? Because he wants you to be part of the family. He wants you to be part of the brethren. He wants to be your brother. And we don't say this in a flippant way. We don't say this in an unrespectful way. We realize that he is God and he is far greater than us and we are nothing like him. But to be able to look and see how Jesus views us and how he loves us is truly remarkable and truly encouraging. He views us as brothers and sisters. Whenever the people during Jesus' life, whenever the people um, said to Jesus in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 12 that, hey, your, your mother and your, your brothers are here to see you, what, what did he turn and tell to those messengers? What did he tell them? Behold, my brother 
and my mother, right? The, the people around, the people who are disciples, the people who are following. He loved the individuals who were, di- who were, who were his disciples and, were who, and who were following him. So with this in mind here in verse 11, let us talk about six different things that our brother has done. Brother, the, uh, our, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who, who calls us brethren. Number one, our brother is very humble. Something we've already talked about, but look again at verse 9. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels. Okay? Why did he do this? Why did he leave heaven? Why did he do this? Who did he do this for? He did it for us. He did it for us. That's a humble action that he did right there. Here's Jesus Christ not being selfish in any way. And of course, if you go back to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5, it tells us... uh, the illustration is put forth for us that we can know how to act ourselves. We need to act in a humble way. We need to act in a way that's not selfish. We need to act in a way that we are willing to sacrifice ourselves and to do everything that we have to do, even obedience, as Jesus was obedience to the point of death. But we need to have the want, the desire to take care of our brothers and sisters in Christ and to be selfless because that's who Christ was. Christ was one who was indeed humble little while lower than the angels, as we see right here. Comments or questions about this? Our humble Savior. Here's another one. Our brother suffered for us. Continue reading verse 9. Namely, Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him... For whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through suffering. Okay, what did Jesus Christ do for us? Not only did our brother give up that place in heaven for you and I in a humble manner and come down here and live with you and I, being born in a manger, not only did he do that, but he also suffered. In what ways did he suffer? Of course, we think of the death on the cross. We think about, yes, ma'am. That's right. He suffered the disrespect of the people that he came to help. Very, very good point. He came to, to help them, and they disrespected him. They spit in his face. They, they killed him, and, and he said, forgive them they know not what they do. He, he was so humble, and he suffered so much. Uh, you know, something, well, we, we talk about the, uh, the crucifixion, and we know how bad the crucifixion was. Um, maybe sometimes we, we forget, though, how bad it was, how excruciating this, this pain was. Uh, we're told that um, the Romans' method of, of, killing, uh, of killing someone that they needed to put to death was, was one of the worst in history. Of course, they would take the individual, they'd strip, strip him naked, they would take those leather straps, which would have, of course, woven into them bone and rock and other sharp items, and, and they'd whip the, the entire back from, from the neck all the way down to the legs of the individual, and that, that, that whip wouldn't just hit and bounce off, that that whip would grab hold and and rip. And this would happen many, many times, sometimes up to nearly 40 times, to the point that bone could be seen, to the point that blood would be flowing out, to the point that many individuals who suffered this type of scourging oftentimes died even before they got to um, the actual crucifixion because of the amount of, of blood loss. Jesus Christ, of course, endured that. He suffered that. And then, of course, he carried his own cross a good distance, of course, allowing more blood to be flowing out of his body. And then, of course, he was nailed to that cross. And from what I've read, that, those nerves there in your wrist, those nerves there in your wrist, whenever they were crushed by those nails, that's where we get the word excruciating from because it was so excruciating, one of the worst pains that anyone could possibly endure was having nails gone through those particular nerves that are there in your wrist 
So not only has he gone through the scourging, not only has he carried his own cross, now he is enduring this terrible, terrible pain, not only in his wrists, but also in his feet. And then he's up on the cross. And you can imagine, and I know I'm telling this to, to individuals who, who know all about um, uh, the death of Jesus, this is nothing new for you. But as he's hanging there on the cross, gravity's working. So his arms are up above his head, and it's, it's hard to breathe that way. You can't breathe that way. So the individual who's on the cross is having to pull themselves up just to get a breath. But your back has been split in so many different times from the scourging, and now there's splinters on, splinters on this board, and, and, and you're weak. You can only do it for so long, and then you let gravity take hold again. And you're doing this over and over and over again until you lose enough blood, until you have a heart attack, until your body gives out. And why I bring this up is to remind us what he did for us. He suffered for us. He did all of this for us. Amazing. And then he's willing to call us brethren. Uh, our Savior is so, so amazing in all that he did for us. Comments or questions about any of that here in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Here's a third. Our brother is not ashamed of us. Look at verse 11 through 13. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Saying, verse 12, I will, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Do we see right here, and of course, these, uh, there in verses 12 and, and 13, you have these prophecies from Psalm 22 and verse 22. But you have this, uh, the, these, these prophecies coming to us, talking about how uh, the Christ is calling, of course, um, uh, us, the children. Behold, I and the children whom God has given me. But notice there again in verse 12, the last portion for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Um, go over to chapter 4 in verse 14. Chapter 4 in verse 14 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. What's one of the, whenever we talk about the five steps of salvation, what's one of the five steps that we uh, participate in, that we, that we do through obedience. What is that? Confess. Now, whenever we think of confess, is that just, you know, oftentimes, I was talking to someone who, who's not a Christian that I'm studying with this week, and whenever I asked about this confession, his assumption was the same thing that I think oftentimes we think of. Well, confession is saying I'm sorry for, for sins. Well, that's more part of the repentance part. But this confession, of course, is is an understanding that you're letting the world know, I believe in Jesus. I believe in who he is. And I'm, I'm proud of him. I'm not ashamed of him. And I know we've talked about this before, but here in verse 14, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to Christians, and these Christians, of course, have already made the good confession. And here's the Hebrew writer saying, now, hold on to it. Don't let go of that confession confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and not being ashamed of him is not just a one-time thing that you do in front of a congregation or you do in front of just a few people as you're getting ready to be baptized. That's part of it. But now it's a lifelong commitment to saying, I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm not going to be ashamed of him. I'm not going to be ashamed to tell people that I, I'm a, a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be ashamed to um, let people know that I'm going to obey Jesus Christ in every aspect of my life because this is what he has done for me, I need to not be ashamed of Jesus. And one of the reasons why is because he's not ashamed of you and me. He's not ashamed of us. Yes, ma'am. Sure. There you go. 
That's right. And that, of course, is, is the Heavenly Father. Great point. Yes, ma'am. We have the same Father, absolutely. And, and He's not, and, and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are not ashamed of us. They're not ashamed of us if, of course, we're not um, ashamed of them. Um, what did Jesus say in Matthew 10, 32? Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. And then in verse 33, but whoever denies, be, denies me before men, what happens? I will deny him before my Father who is in heaven. If we are obedient children of God, children of the Father, our brother Jesus Christ is not going to be ashamed of us. All right? And he's going to confess us before his Father. Yes, this is one of my brethren. This is one of the individuals that I have saved. He, he, he's ours. He, he's part of the children of God. And truly, truly amazing. Our brother is not ashamed of us. Hey, you know, just bringing this back to, you know, you, you brought up the, the earthly illustration. I'll bring it back to an earthly illustration as well. I'm the oldest of nine kids. I'll be honest, there's been some times I didn't want, especially whenever I was, you know, a young man, you know, uh, looking for a wife. You know, I don't necessarily want these young women to all know that I've got all these little, little kids, you know. I, I was kind of ashamed uh, of my brothers and sisters on occasion, right? That's, that's not, that is not our Savior. That's not our brother. He is not ashamed of us if we, of course, are individuals who are following him. If we love him and keep his commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15. Comments or questions? All right, here's another one. Our brother defeated the devil. Look at verses 14 and 15. Back in chapter 2, 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and then uh, verse 15, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Okay, what did Jesus Christ do? He came down, he was humble, gave himself um, over to uh, being a, a, a human being, coming down here, living with us. He suffered that cruel death. He's not ashamed of us. And then he defeated the devil. Uh, keep your finger here, but go over to Colossians real quick. And look at a couple of things. Look at um, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. Let's start in verse 13. Colossians 2, starting in verse 13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having, con having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Look at verse 15. How did he do this? When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Now, as you read through that, you might think, okay, rulers and authorities, are we just talking about earthly rulers and authorities? Are we talking about Pontius Pilate? Are we talking about the, uh, the, the scribes and the Pharisees? I think we get a little bit better of an answer if you look back at chapter 1 and verse 16. 1 and verse 16 says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible. So you have the visible things, the things of the earth, the invisible things, the things of the spiritual world. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. We had a foe. We have a foe. A foe, of course, who is wanting to kill us. A foe that's wanting to make sure that we go to eternal hell away from God. He wants this. Satan wants this. But here's Jesus Christ. He's already defeated Satan. He's already defeated him. Now, Satan can still ensnare us. He can still trip us up, but we need to understand that the, the enemy that we fight, he's already defeated. He's already defeated by our brother, as we're going about with this uh, illustration or this uh, words of, of a brother here in Hebrews chapter 2. But our brother has already defeated him. He's already paid the price. He's already done 
everything that needs to be done. Now it's up to you and I to continue to obey, obey Jesus Christ to be saved and to, can, to continue staying away from the devil. But our brother defeated the devil. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. Comments or questions? Here's another. Number five. Our brother cares for us. Look at verse 16. This is going back to the illustration of the um, Jesus Christ being greater than the angels. For assuredly, chapter 2, verse 16, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Again, talking to a Hebrew um, population, a Jewish population here in the book of Hebrews, someone, uh, individuals who are going to hold up in high esteem these angels, here is the Hebrew writer saying, listen, your Savior, our Savior, our brother, is one who loves us so much and he helps us, he aids us, he takes care of us, he cares for us. And there's even a comparison between us and the angels right here. So we see that he cares for us. And of course he's cared for us in so many different ways that we've already talked about, specifically with salvation, saving us from our own sins. Which brings us to our sixth point, unless there's a comment or question about that. And that is verse 17 and 18, our brother aids us. 17 and 18. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Back in Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, both of them talking about the um, temptations of Jesus Christ. Here he is being tempted, just like you and I, okay? He came down here in a humble state, not only taking on the form of a man, not only taking on the uh, ability to suffer and to die for you and I, but also the ability to be, to be tempted, to, to, to face temptation, just like each and every one of us have, have faced temptation, and we've all failed. But here he is, he faced temptation, and of course he, he, he won. He won against this temptation. He, he did not fall to Satan. He did not fall to the devil. And we see right here, because of this, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. How does he aid us? With this knowledge, with this knowledge that he has of what it means to be tempted, how does he aid us? How does he help us? Say that again. Okay, through prayer. Very good. We can, we can receive, we can uh, hold on to the benefits of, of being a child of God, of course, through praying, through praying during our, our temptation. Good point. Great point. Forgiveness of sins, okay, very, very good. Of course, we, we have our, our sins washed away. But also think about this. Jesus Christ was one who was willing to come down and share in temptation, share in, in, in uh, feeling the, the desire to, to do what Satan wanted you to do. Yes, ma'am, Miss Nancy. There you go. Very good. Okay. Very, very good. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll get over there in just a second. While we're here in Hebrews, look at Hebrews chapter 4 real quick again. Look at verse 15, and then we'll go over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in a second. But Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with let me start that over again. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Okay? He has done what we were unable to do. He was tempted like you and I, but he was able to do it in such a way that he was not, he did not fall for the temptation. He did not sin. And because of that, we go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which Nancy was talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And look over here at verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, 
who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. What a great promise. What an awesome promise. He's, he's aiding us, right? He's aiding us in our tempt- in, during our temptations. Now, what does this mean? What does this aiding mean? Does this mean that he's not going to allow us to be tempted very, diff- uh, very hard? Does this mean that he's um, just going to, you know, we might be tempted quickly and then just that temptation's taken away? I, I don't think that's what this means at all. Here's Jesus. Jesus, of course, has been fasting for 40 days. And what, is, what does Satan bring to him? What does Satan tell him to do? Hey, turn those rocks into bread. I mean, that, that's, that is some temptation right there. Some great temptation. You've had no food for this long. And, and of course, food is definitely on Jesus' mind because he is a human being. But we see right here, Jesus Christ, of course, did not sin, and he's able to aid us. He's able to come to our aid, and here, as Paul writes about in chapter 10 and verse 13 of 1 Corinthians, we will have a way of escape given to us that we can endure it. Now, temptation is still going to be out there. Hard temptation is still going to be out there, because Satan's a, a prowling lion seeking someone to devour. He's taking out those fiery darts, as is talked about in Ephesians chapter 6, and he's constantly, constantly shooting them uh, our way. He wants us down, and he's, he, doesn't, he doesn't read minds. He can't be everywhere, at every place, at every time, but he's a great observer, and he's an individual who has uh, demons as his aid, helping him, trying to tempt us so many different ways that he's going to try to get us down and it's going to be hard and it's going to be difficult but we need to look for that way of escape and that way of escape oftentimes happens by reading the scripture reading the scripture knowing what is right knowing what is wrong and then finding the way out Hank uh huh There you go. Great point. And have that faith in him that uh, he did what he said he did. Have that faith in him that he's able to save us from our own sins. Have that faith in him that he went through temptations just like us, and he endured, and he's going to give us the ability to endure as well. Great point. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Great point. Because we are going to fail. We do fail. We don't have to. We can get back up, uh, we can get up and we can be individuals who follow him. We will occasionally fail, we will occasionally fall down. We get back up and as Simon the sorcerer was told to do, repent, uh, repent and pray. And that's what we have to do and he gives us that grace. Another comment? All right. Well, that's about all I got, so I'll give you guys about five minutes extra. But I appreciate you all so much. Thank you.